authorised psychiatrists will be able to prescribe medicines containing the substances to treat certain mental health conditions from the 1st of July. Well, joining me now live is the Professor uh, and Deputy Director of the Neuromedicines Discovery Centre at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Professor Chris Langmead. Uh, Professor, really appreciate your time this afternoon. Can you talk us through these changes and how long it's taken for this uh, advocacy, essentially, to lead to this change from the TGA? There has been a renewed interest in looking at substances such as MDMA and psilocybin for, for many years. In fact, much work was done in the 1960s, but it really is only in the last two or three or four years but that there's been significantly large clinical trials that have studied the effectiveness of, of MDMA when used combined with uh, psychotherapy for the treatment of PTSD or psilocybin uh, when combined with psychotherapy for the treatment of uh, very difficult to treat depression. And it is the large amount of emerging clinical data around the safety and the effectiveness of these um, medicines when used under very strictly controlled uh, clinical conditions that has led the TGA to, to make this decision. So are there safeguards in place that would prevent, for instance, these substances from getting into the wrong hands? So the idea is that currently these uh, drugs or medicines are uh, essentially classified as Schedule 9, which means they are prohibited substances. And it means that for the treatment of PTSD, in the case of MDMA, and for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression, in the case of psilocybin, these um, medicines will be reclassified as Schedule 8, which means they are controlled drugs, and they'll be able to use, be used in a clinical context in the same way, for example, that uh, uh, ketamine or other opioid analgesics are used uh, in an operating theatre, for example. And how common are these drugs or substances used in treatment? Well... There's been a number of clinical trials over the last uh, few years, so yeah. increasingly patients are being exposed to them. We know that a number of patients, for example, there are a large number of veterans uh, who suffer from quite horrendous PTSD who have uh, travelled overseas um, to South America, for example, to access um, psychedelic substances because they feel so utterly failed by the, the current standard of care that um, we're able to offer. But in terms of uh, legitimate, you know, regulator approved uh, um, use, Australia is essentially leading the way or one of the countries leading the way. They are the first country to essentially say that you, we can use these substances uh, appropriately uh, for the treatment of these um let's face it, very, very difficult to treat mental health disorders. No doubt. And, and what, I guess, is the next step for practitioners, professors such as yourself? Uh, obviously, there's still a bit of time before July the 1st. So what, what, what's going to take the focus now ahead of them actually being able to be used in this context? Well, you, you say there's a bit of time, but there's also... In, in many senses, not not a lot of time as well, because we need to essentially put together an, a framework of how a, uh, a prescribing, an authorised prescribing psychiatrist um, that has approval of a, a human ethics committee, which is going to be required as well, is going to administer these substances, the protocol that they're going to follow. Um, it's, it's important for... Um, viewers to know that most protocols that have been used in clinical trials only require one, two or three doses of, of these substances. For example, uh, the, the, the effectiveness of MDMA can last for many, many, many months uh, after simply three mm. sessions of, uh, of an MDA uh, assisted psychotherapy. But it's going to be really important for us to work out how that rolls out, how the authorised prescriber uh, rolls out the, the the ethics approval that is going to be required. And in the future, we have essentially set a, a, a regulatory framework by which some of these medicines can be approved for use. And then now it's going to be incumbent on us to work out 
you know, which other disorders, if any, are these uh, medicines effective in? And there are many other medicines of this type in clinical trials around the world. So it really does represent uh, a major first step, albeit a small first step in us um, working out how we can bring so much benefit to patients who need it so much.